Uh, my name is Mario Haro, and uh, I started with uh, Occupy Portland. On uh, officially with Occupy Portland when the first march was on October 6, 2011. And um, but I've been uh, politically active and politically minded uh, since a pretty young age. Um, I wrote a I wrote a story or I wrote a paper in um, in middle school about uh, Pancho Villa and uh, you know why he became a revolutionary and uh, and uh, yeah so I I also tried to organize a couple of uh, uh, I, my first action that I technically organized was this uh, dance revolution party for um, like Thomas Jefferson some people got arrested for for that for like dancing at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial and then there was like this National Day of Action in like Jan uh, July 2011 before Occupy Portland started. So I tried to organize that. My first protest that I ever went to was against the Afghanistan and Iraq war in um, Washington, D.C. in like 2000, 2002. So I've always been anti-war, anti-death penalty, you know. Um, and now, because of because of Occupy, I was able to uh, meet a lot of people that were uh, that were not just left leaning, but you know, really, uh, you know, vehemently against uh, authority in the state and the idea of corporations and banks. And I've always kind of felt like that, but I never really had that community until uh, Occupy Portland came around. And um, yeah, that just that energy of. Um, you know, people actually helping each other just just to help each other and get by, as opposed to people needing to make money off of people, which is uh, what this you know death culture that we live in today is based off of, based off of violence and um, you know the same uh, the same systems that uh, gave us the give that gave people their freedom for protest in all these years is the same system that well if these folks wouldn't have stuck up for themselves within the system they would be you know, still, you know, second, third class, you know, slaves, essentially. And now we got, uh, we're, we, we're supposed to trust this system that justified, you know, slavery for, you know, a couple hundred years. And then now, because we have this different form of, you know, mental slavery, we're supposed to just trust it. And um, because of Occupy, you know, I always felt like I was like, oh man, like, I gotta just, you know, feed into the system and do the best I can and, you know, get by and then luckily, hopefully things will ha happen, you know what I mean? But with Occupy, I found a, a community of people that actually wants to, you know, foster a culture of revolution and, and resistance to the, to the status quo that, uh, you know, is not gonna be easily defeated, you know? It's been going on, this type of uh, oppression has been going on even before 1492. I mean, the, uh, the poor people of Europe, you know, back then were, were oppressed, you know what I mean? And they just had to keep on you know, expanding, you know, just that's how the system of capitalism works. You just expand, 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 and uh, keep growing. And, and this growth is based off of a, essentially a, 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 a pillaging and raping of, of, of culture, of uh, natural resources, and of literally people, and, you know, murder. And um, basically what's happened you know, since uh, 1492 is just this, you know, decimation of indigenous people, you know, the Native, Native American peoples, you know, um, it, it's just, it's, it's really sad, but it's also uh, knowing that, you know, like being a part of, of like resistance and building this new culture is, is really humbling and it's a beautiful thing. So, you know, if it wasn't for Occupy, I wouldn't have met the people that I know now that are you know truly down for revolution now occupy brought a lot of people together that you know some folks they're really they're really content with you know the middle class lifestyle they're really content with um the easily um you know affordable quote unquote uh you know things shiny things and you know consumerism and you know they they, they lost their piece of the pie maybe their mother or their father or their uncle or cousin like got a house for us closed on because you know everybody's getting their Everybody knows someone in, in America that has a house that's foreclosed on. So maybe they, one of their friends or family lost their 
the slice of the American pie, you know. And so they, so they're frustrated. And they showed up at Occupy, and um, I, you know, my family had already, you know, it, you know, I come from a background where we had already written, written out of the, out of, out of it, you know, written out of the American dream, you know, just, just be a slave, uh, wage slave, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, luckily you're not in jail, and you know that's the attitude that is pervasive, you know, pervasive for folks, folks like me. You know what I mean? And um, so Occupy brought a lot of folks, a lot of the reformists in, brought a lot of revolutionaries in, and then it's kind of evolved into this, you know, semi, you know, revolutionary movement that has, still has some, uh, what's it called, um, chance if folks actually really want to make a change. But, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, centrist leanings from you know liberals that want to um, accommodate uh, the system because they feel they identify with it still and um, they identify and to identify with the system means that you identify with genocide you, you identify with with hurt the, with the violence against another person just for, specifically for you know personal property you know for private property and um, Basically, like questioning the whole, not just the capitalist system, but a socialist system, any, any sort of you know Eurocentric system um, that has you know permeated the the, the world now since essentially 1492, um, that needs to be questioned, and Occupy provided an opportunity for that to a certain extent. So um, you know that the the work is the work is still going, you know, and it, Occupy did not you know, come out of a vacuum, um, you know, there's, there was a lot of, you know, people fighting the system for a long, long time, and, you know, from the, you know, the EZLN in Chiapas, you know, the, the Zapatistas, all the way to, you know, the anti-war folks in the, er in the early 2000s, even though a lot of them were mostly reformists, because they're not out there talking about Obama, even though he's, he's murdering just like you know George W, George H W or George W, excuse me, and um, you know, but uh, in you know the late 90s, the the ELF, the Earth Liberation Front, the ALF, the Animal, Animal Liberation Front, you know those groups are resi were resisting were resisting the status quo, and you know the American Indian Movement, you know in the 70s. Um, the, you know, the Black Panthers, the, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't just Martin Luther King and, you know, Gandhi that made changes. It's, there's all these other groups that, were, that, that keep on pushing and striving. And, you know, um, it's kind of come to a head now because the, the energy of the world, you know, it's 2012, it's, it's, it's a new, you know, it's a new time, new time coming through. Um, and there's just so much information out there that people have access to. And it's just so blatant that the system is, is just destroying the earth and destroying humanity, people, um, because we're not connected to the earth anymore. We're not living, living sustainably. We're, we're, we're like parasites right now when in fact human, humans can live with the earth, you know, like, like symbiotically. You know, we don't need, we don't need all this technology, you know, I'm, we're, you know, we're privileged, privileged enough to have this camera and these lights around right here. But at, at what cost? What, at what cost? Do we have to destroy other cultures just so, you know, we have cheap cameras for people? We've got to, you know, decimate indigenous folks. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rough because you realize that when you say those types of things, you know, there's a lot of people that, are, that wouldn't, wouldn't survive, you know? Because we don't have these technologies, we don't have, we wouldn't have necessarily like the medical advances that we have in a, you know, in a fully sustainable world. But if if we don't have any clean water to drink, if we don't have any, you know, trees that clean the air, and if we don't have any fish and you know uh, to eat that's healthy out of the out of the sea, if we don't have any clean ground to to if it, all the ground is has nuclear fallout 
in it. I mean, how are we going to eat, you know? And um, it doesn't take a scientist to figure that one out, you know? It doesn't take a scientist to figure that one out. The, they, the indigenous peoples, the Native Americans, this land have been saying this for a long time. And it's, it's finally coming to a head. There's, there's a lot of mainstream folks that are really understanding that. And you really know that it's happening and it's real when corporate America tries to steal, and when corporate America comes and steals and co-ops these ideas of sustainability and, you know, uh, you know co cooperate, cooperate um, you know, cooperative uh, type of, you know, leanings. And so right now we're, we're at a, we're, we're at a, we're at a point where it's like, you know, Occupy came and, and it's here still, you know what I mean? To a certain extent, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that folks are organizing and, and fighting the system. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, as long as it's resistance to the status quo to make an actual sustainable, like healthy world to live in, then that's really all that matters. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that your, your, your stocks dropped it does you know because all your stocks is are, it's just a facade you know it, do, it doesn't matter that you know corporations aren't making enough profits like that's not profits are not what makes you know it doesn't feed people profits just go into the you know into a bank it doesn't feed people and you know we're at a time where it's like if we keep on cutting the tops off of mountains if we keep on you know building these nuclear, you know, facilities and keep on starting wars across the world. I mean, it's, we're not going to have anything to left to, for the children. And there's no point in that. There's no point in that. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with why I joined Occupy. And that's, that's, that's about it, really. So, what were specifically some of the most uh, rewarding actions that you took? Like, what have been some of the more important, impactful actions that you took? Um, well, when we had the camp, it w the just the actual camp, you know, for me personally, you know, cooking for people at the camp, because you know you're making sure that people get healthy food that's you know good for you, and you know to be a part of that, you know, feeding, you know. Uh, you know, five, six hundred people a day, you know, three times a day, more so, because we would, we had a 24-7 kitchen, so we'd just cook food and just put it out, so it was great. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to say, but in, so the actual encampment, and then um, when I got arrested the morning, the eviction morning, November 13th, 2011, um, that was, that was kind of like the, the nail in the coffin in terms of my idea that something could be done by getting arrested peacefully and nonviolently. Nothing's, it's not gonna really change too much. I mean, for me, you know, it's, I need to do something else. Other people can do that and I respect them and I've, and I've done it, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just do that again. And I don't wanna do that anymore, you know what I mean? Like. Uh, if I'm blocking something, you know what I mean, blocking some sort of capital coming through, there's a little bit different, different aspect of it. But um, I don't know, just getting arrested like that, it's not, it's not, it's not worth it for me. I'd rather have time to, uh, you know, build community outside of um, the state. <laughs> but you know, I respect people that get arrested still. So, but that was pretty beautiful the night before that on November 13th, right at 12.01, they said we need to leave the park. We had 10,000 people there, you know, um, fighting the cops away. And they all left in the morning. Not all of them, there was 400 that stayed or so. And um, man, getting arrested on that one, that was just real interesting, you know, just because uh, you just, I don't know, but at one point I thought, you know, really, they're just gonna kick us out, you know what I mean? This is just ridiculous. And I don't know. I just don't want to deal with them like that anymore. So I'm cool. But uh, the other, another really great action was uh, January 25th, just because um, 
for me personally, like, you know, I, I help organize that and I feel that, uh, you know, I read a lot of revolutionary writings and um, Franz Fanon said that in the wretched of the earth that, you know, we need to build our own new culture and, you know, have our own holidays essentially. So, you know, January 25th really inspired me as a person in 2011, um, Tahrir Square, a million people, you know, um, you know, they ousted a dictator that the Americans, you know, put in essentially. And now we, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like they're still going through their, through their stuff and revolting. So it's like, it's an inspirational day that we need to, you know, as people, like, you know, as a global community, you know, kind of like mass around because um, it's, it's about the power of the people coming together and building community and building a new culture. And that's, that's what's going to make the change. It's, that's what's going to make the change is building a new culture outside of this death culture and, and essentially screaming at the top of our lungs that we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to play by your rules anymore. Your system is not for us. It clearly isn't for us and it's clearly not for the earth. So we'll stop your system when we need to stop it and we'll just let it go when we'll let it go because we have other things to, to deal with. But you know, it would, I would be, I would have a, I had a, I would have a severe case of, um, what is it called, uh, hubris to think that, you know, I personally could make this change, you know, right now to change the world for a better place personally right now, you know, but I can lay the foundation so my, the next generation can actually have a fighting chance so their next generation might have a clean earth, you know what I mean? A world without war, you know? A world based on, you know, how much you can help people, not in how much you can make money off of people. Like, so January 25th was a really, is a really important day and I helped organize an action. I got arrested that day too. So that was, uh, that was what's up. A lot of people came out just because um, they respected me and, not, and you know, of course, the day, January 25th. But a lot of folks were like, well, I heard you organize this, man. And I wanted to, I wanted to help you out, you know, and show up. So I wrote a speech because I had visited my children the, the weekend before, and it was on Monday. I uh, wrote a speech and wrote it on the train there. And um, I'm really... Uh, you know, I'm really blessed and humbled that folks want to talk to me and want to, uh, you know, hear my opinion about Occupy and just the, you know, revolution in general. And, um, yeah. So, um, in an ideal outcome, what would you like to see taking place or what would you hope for change? Um, well, ideally, you know, I, I guess ideally, you know, we'd stop like all mining, we'd stop all uh, pillaging of the earth, um, you know, all industry essentially needs to kind of like halt to a certain extent and we need a complete reorganization of all of the resources on the earth and get an adequate um, distribution in terms of localized economies and, um, and then, you know, in, in certain cases where people need global help, then, then you know, you get those infrastructures kind of built up. That would be ideal, but that's really pie in the sky and that's what we're working for, that's what I'm working for and, I'm, and there's some other folks out there working for that type of thing, but um, uh, the likelihood of that, of me seeing that in my lifetime is very, very slim to nil. Unless, you know, the global economic, economic collapse happens and then, you know, the, the people just don't show up to industry because they realize that they can't eat a dollar bill or a, a thing of gold. They can't drink that either. They can't drink their 401k and get water out of it. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, barring, a, you know, economic, you know, the global economic collapse and, um, you know, some sort of like, like nuclear holocaust that could be, could happen because, you know, our president has like a, you know, slip trigger finger and, you know, they, they're, they're puppet masters telling the freaking off with their, off with the world. I mean, barring all that stuff, <laughs> I 
I don't, you know, I don't know. Ideally, you know, we would have a peaceful world, but you know, I'm, I'm just working to build a culture of resistance to the dominant culture right now because, well, that's really all we can do and just work outside of their system, you know, like use the things that we need to use from them, you know, but uh, don't acknowledge them as anything other than, you know, a tool to make it, make a more egalitarian world, a world without hierarchy uh, and other than a, a natural hierarchy with, you know, our Mother Earth. And, um, you know, and actually get some sort of restorative, like, justice to the uh, indigenous cultures that have been, you know, destroyed. Ideally, that would happen.